to to you to, to have a conversation about what and share with us what you want to share with us about the proposal. Mm -hmm. I think then we will turn to the the representation from both the Coastal Harbor and Shellfish Commission, and, you know, because it you know it doesn't involve the working waterfront, and they'll they'll have some questions and concerns, and then I think we'll just open it up to a conversation. Sure. So if that works for everybody, mm -hmm. Tom, I guess yeah. it's yours. So I must uh, admit at the outset, I'm just, my research is ongoing. There's a, there's quite a bit of research, or, uh, things in the file through the years. Uh, as near as I can tell, the co-op itself uh, began in 1947. Uh, it was, as you might uh, think, it was a, a initially a band of uh, fishermen, but it pretty quickly grew to over 100 members, most of which were non-fishermen, actually, uh, really interested in promoting and, and assuring uh, public access uh, to the working waterfront. And initially in the early years worked with a private landowner and um, was able to purchase uh, uh, a piece of land that we now know is, uh, is the, uh, the co-op property there. Uh, and then ultimately the town bought it uh, and that became the uh, town's public landing. Um, ultimately in 1963, uh, the selectmen at the time agreed to deed for uh, one dollar um, a piece of property and the structures on it to the Pine Point Fisherman's Co-op. And then um, at the time there were a number of uh, pretty important deed restrictions associated with that, that uh, conveyance, if you will. Uh, essentially the council, uh, or the town, um, it would be the council now, must consent to any subsequent sale. Uh, secondly, there was a limitation on the total indebtedness or any mortgage amount that could be held on the property. Uh, and thirdly, there was uh, there are limitations as to expansion of the building, um, and through the years, those three restrictions have been modified somewhat. Uh, they've essentially stayed in, in place, but they've been modified over time. Um, first in 1967, and again, then again in 1977, uh, as I recall. And so the current restrictions um, uh, are that the town must still consent to any sale. The town must approve any mortgage indebtedness on the property in excess of $125,000. And any expansion of the building uh, must occur on the front and back only. Said another way, it cannot expand uh, on either side of the building. But it can go up. I mean, it can, they can build up. There's no, by my research, there's no deed restriction that prohibits any expansion vertically. Uh, Other than ordinance. Uh, yeah, there, there are other town ordinances that would prohibit and, height, and there's and there's a state, the state, state, right. state is a big one, yeah. right? And certainly, uh, expansion toward the river and also toward the parking lot, I think, has its own. Each has its own practical challenges. So uh, I'm just laying it out that there's no legal bar, but I think there's some huge practical and regulatory challenges, perhaps. What, what would the state regular uh, requirements be for going up in the town ordinance? What are those restrictions? Could you guys just Outline those real quickly for uh, shoreland zoning. I um, think Katie, because I'm 250 feet back from the. I think he's yeah. from the water. I'm talking about going. He's asking up. about the vertical. That's a, oh. even with vertical. Any change to footprint would probably have to go through DEP. So, but that wouldn't change the footprint, right? Going vertical. It depends. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, square it's, footage is a bunch of stuff they there, look at. Suffice to say, there are no easy answers. I, yeah. There would be huge regulatory well, challenges. Well, I was just thinking, even if you went straight up, the town, the town, uh, the town only allows three stories, right? It depends on the zone. I'm, I beg your pardon. I'm just not conversant in all those particulars. We can certainly research that, and I'll provide that to council. Beyond that, any change of use or expansion of use, which that would be, would require parking requirements. And so there's just a number of other domino effects that come into play. Suffice to say, it, it would be challenging at best. But possibly. Theoretically, yes. Uh, so what brings us together is really, um, we do have prospective buyers here, the current owner. One of them is here with us this evening, uh, really to introduce themselves, their idea. They understand fully that they need to obtain consent from the, the town. They're also looking for a modification on the uh, mortgage indebtedness limit. Um, there's also a parking lease that uh, we've not really talked about, but it does require consent as well. And uh, so I guess all of that's in play, and we wanted to use this opportunity to introduce it to the council, but also to the public. And I'm pleased that... Uh, Two of your committees have already met to discuss this, and I think we have representatives here tonight that are prepared, uh, hopefully, to um, offer some observations and express uh, some comment uh, for your guidance. 
So with that, I think it might be helpful for Sue and Vincent to introduce themselves and their their uh, thoughts of the property. Sure. Yep. All right. Um, <coughs> Vincent and I have been operating Bailey's Lobster Pound, which is a uh, family business that's been in my family for 105 years. Um, it is four properties away from the Hancock Fisherman's Call. We personally live two doors away from the Call. Um, so we have a great deal of familiarity with this project. Um, Newspaper articles as old as this are, are actually familiar to us, and the names on them are still. So um, we currently operate a business that's very similar to what the co-op is doing. We do buy lobsters from local lobster fishermen. Um, we buy steamers, though not currently from local people, but we do buy steamers for our restaurants. We operate a trap-to-table concept in our restaurants so that um, we try to keep as much local seafood um, going directly to consumers as possible. And we see this as a really good fit for us for a lot of reasons. Um, the primary reason is that we understand the working waterfront issues in, the, in our area very well. And we have 100% intent of maintaining those working waterfront issues. Because, as I, I was present at the meeting that, the, that these gentlemen had, and as we tried to explain to them, it's in our best interest to maintain the working waterfront. It's what we do. You know, we're local people. And it's not, it's not just a, a feel-good thing. It's a, it's a business decision for us. Because if we purchase um, goods from local people, instead of having to send our truck somewhere else to purchase from another dealer, it's a better buy for us. We're getting a better purchase price. And we pass that. We go under the, straight to the consumer rather than having to go through a middleman. And so we get a better price on our product. And we can offer a better price to the harvesters because of that. And it, it's in our best interest to do that, too, because then the harvesters will want to sell to us. And the more harvesters we have, the better living we make, just as, as Tim will explain to you as his business works right now. Currently, the business that Tim is running is essentially exactly what we want to do, only we'd like to do a little bit more. You know, We'd like to maybe give the restaurant a facelift and maybe, um, hopefully, maybe buy some clams, and, which maybe he's not buying so many of right now. But it's essentially the same thing. We have no intention of changing any of the plus, you know, square footage inside the building. Currently, the way the walls are, the way everything's set up is fine for us. Um, and we are not asking for any changes on the third um, item that Tom mentioned as far as expansion. We're not requesting that because we have no intention to do any expansion because, frankly, we live on properties in Pine Point and we know what the regulatory challenges mm -hmm. are and they're very significant. Um, in addition, the building that uh, I think Will was commenting on about or Travis was potentially going up, you know, it's an old building, and it, it might not mm. just be a regulatory challenge, it might be a construction challenge, and um, properties on the water are expensive, and, you know, this is a big mortgage for us, and the idea of buying it and then tearing it down and starting over is really not in the cards for us right off. We have to be able to make a living out of the building before we ever thought about that, and frankly, I, knowing what I know about the DEP restrictions, I, mm. I don't see it happening. It's a 100% um, non-expansion within 75 feet of the water line currently, and that building's on the water line, so mm -hmm. I don't see that happening. But um, the transfer we just see as a win-win for everyone. We're local people. Um, Tim and Gary, and I won't, I won't speak much more for you, Tim, but um, clearly they, they want to sell the building. They've had a couple of other people interested in it, and deals have fallen through for one reason or another. Um, we think we're a good choice because we are absolutely 100% local. We live down here and we have for a long time. We have real skin in the game to want to do well in Pine Point because you know, all of our businesses are down there. We've invested emotionally down there. We've invested heavily financially. We redid the garage barbecue two years ago. Um, we like to think that we were very respectful to the history of Conroy's garage. Um, we maintained a lot of the things from Conroy's past and I think that everyone who knows that area can see that we've, we've really tried to um, make a nicer landing area when you come into Pine Point, make it look nice, make it positive to everybody involved, whether it's residents or people from Hawaii coming in. Um, so we, we really think that we're the right choice for this building, and we fully intend to maintain the working waterfront status the way it is, or do more with it. Um, the other question was the mortgage amount. Both Tom and I discussed this, and I'm not 100% sure why they said it in the first place. I mean, I guess there's a couple of ways to look at it. Um, they, the town at the time might have wanted to make sure that 
if it was going to be given up that the town had the chance to purchase the property, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was the intent because I can't find it spelled out anywhere, but um, you know, I, I don't know if it's the town's intent to buy the property now, but I don't think that, I think that you're missing one deed. I think that the, it went from 120 to 170 back when you guys were involved somewhere in the last 30 years. But at any rate, I think it's, it's still at a level that for a waterfront property is probably far too low to consider reasonable. Um, yeah, just to clarify that point, there is no right of first refusal, which is, would be the typical real estate um, mechanism whereby we, the original grantor, would have a right when it's going for sale to purchase the property and be subject to all the market conditions and buy it at fair market value typically. There is a, a reversion com component, though, if the co-op ceases to exist, I think for a period of dormancy of a year, mm -hmm. then it reverts back to the town. So there's a reversion, but not a right of first refusal. I, I think, think that's, that, no, it's I been, think that's, that's been, that's been, that's been extinguished that's been, as well. That's been extinguished, yeah. yeah. Well, that was, that was part of the original uh, Right, it was part of the original yeah, I, I, and I, I'm sure you have the, a copy of the I believe the deed, so. but... but well, we can provide that for you after the meeting so you can yeah. see it, but, um, but it's not the case at this time, at, in any rate. I have a copy of the agreement for 170. Okay. Then you can have that if you want. Okay. Um, as to, I think the parking was the last thing you mentioned. And um, certainly in order to run the restaurant, we have to have the parking spaces because that's the requirement that the town has. Um, I think, Tom, when I talked to you, a couple of times you felt as though the lease was it transferable, um, but we haven't, I, I never went any further with it because this was clearly the more important meeting before the parking discussion with community services. I think um, it's transferable with town council. Well, there you go, yeah. So um, we're not asking for an increase because the restaurant's gonna remain the same size, so um, I don't think that's necessary. We, uh, we have an added benefit of being down the street because we actually park our employees in a parking lot that is in a distance that they can walk from our other parking lot down to the co-op. So we could actually reduce some of the parking issues by having my employees park in a different area. So it, you know, we have, there's some unique benefits of having us be the owners of the property there. Um, did I miss anything? <laughs> well, I think that's all the bullets. I mean, just, you know, just to reiterate, really no change. Yeah. Business as usual. Question. Want to speak to your retirement? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, let me just give you a, a quickie, Tim and Gary quickie. Um, 1988, uh, we were working for a lobster company in town. In the spring, the <coughs> portion of the boats was selling to us in town. Uh, Co-op was not operating, didn't have a manager. Um, some of the guys asked us to come down. Um, we talked to them, said no. Um, I did that previously, worked for co-op, and said I'll never work for eight bosses again. <laughs> so we, we went to them and said, we'll lease the building from you. We'll set up a company, provide all our own financing, pay you a fair price for your product, take good care of you, take your headaches away. They said yes. Um, after the first year, they said, let's continue. This is working great for us. Um, in around, that's 88, in around 94, 95, the first guy retired. Um, his shares were available. Said, do you want to buy my shares? We said, OK. Um, 97, we bought up the remaining uh, shareholders. Basically, bought bought the co-op through buying the shares uh, with the shareholders. Um. So, technically, you're still a co-op, correct? Legally, we're still a co-op. Okay. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so, I spoke with some older fishermen in the area, and a lot of it's come up that they had thought that the original agreement. I'm not sure if it was with you or with the original formation of the co-op, but that somewhere in the deed paperwork, and I didn't see it in what I got from Tom, had required that it stay a co-op, and that's why you guys weren't able to form no. a corporation. Oh, no, no. I, the, the deed is 
for the fishermen to co-op. It is right now. Because um, the intent was it, to it, maintain it, it, the co-op. In order, right? No, in order to change the deed, it needs council approval, which is one thing, one question they're asking. But but currently it's it's set up as a co-op. Yes. And the original intent of setting that co-op was, and the original intent of the town selling the property for a dollar to the co-op was to support the fishermen, that the fishermen's co-op that was existing. I, I assume so. I wasn't there. Travis, maybe I think, maybe let's, let's let them kind of finish their piece. Sure, yeah, then, sorry. I just, was, you guys I just can, those are some questions I couldn't no, no, answer. No, 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 so. and then maybe you guys can speak to some of the concerns you have, and then we'll kind of open it up for... I'm sure all, all of us have some questions too, so we'll kind of. Totally. So I'm not sure. I'm sorry. 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 Okay. No, so no I'm problem. not sure where you were in the process, but anyway, uh, um, <clears throat> that's been 30 years. Uh, I'm 67. It's my time. <laughs> you know, I can't. I can understand. It is. <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, some of the questions that that you people have, we've already gone over with Sue and Vinny. We've, we've got 30 years of, of a lot of time and effort in operating the co-op, taking care of fishermen, and that's, a, that's an important part of, of this. We've quizzed them pretty hard on what, what are you going to do? Are you going to keep the bait cooler? Are you going to buy from the boats? Mm -hmm. it's, it's before we, we mm -hmm. signed the purchase sale agreement, we went over it very, very hard. Mm -hmm. um, they had all the right answers. That they're going to maintain things as they are. It just, you know, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, let's, any questions as the meeting goes on that I can answer? Yeah, I'm sure free. we'll. I'm, yep. sure, I'm sure we'll circle. Okay. That. <laughs> okay. I don't know which one of you would like to go first, but I know you guys have come guys up with a list of concerns, so. Yeah, um, sure. We had a meeting on Monday night uh, regarding this issue. Uh, it was a joint meeting between the Coastal Waters and Harbor and the Shellfish Conservation Commission. And uh, several people attended. Uh, all the members were there. And we just kind of went through some of the concerns that as fishermen and working waterfront people uh, that we, we have about the sale. Uh, and, uh, Mr. Mr. These these fine gentlemen let us come here to say it. So, um, I guess I'll just kind of go through some of the stuff from our notes. Um, sure. Sorry. Um, we're going to go through some of the issues that we just had at our meeting, um, and and there was a few. Obviously, the bait cooler access was one of them. Um, the letter that we had got from the town didn't really address it. I mean, from uh, Sue and Vinny didn't really address the bait cooler, if they were going to keep it or not. It's a big, um, it's an important part of the working waterfront. Mm -hmm. uh, as a kid, when I was down there, there were several bait coolers. There was one at Bailey's Lobster Pound when Susan's father owned it. There was one at Thurlow's, which is no longer in existence anymore. Uh, when Mike Thurlow used to own On Point Seafood, he also had a lobster buying station uh, where his brother now lives, I believe. And that's that's no longer there, um, and the co so the co-ops is the only one left. So, I think the reason that most the co-op has a significant amount of votes is because there's everybody's really is, is utilizing that bay cooler, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> their operations. <coughs> and if they weren't able to do that, they'd have to drive to Portland every morning, uh, and likely, possibly every night, because some people wouldn't sell bait if you didn't sell them lobster. So, it puts a kind of a damper on things. Um, Travis, could I ask though the bait cooler? You're all purchasing your bait individually through other sources, simply using the cooler to store it, and uh, use it yep. as you need it. There is some delivery. There is some circumstances. But maybe of, the question is more for Tim and Gary. You're not handling the bait. We're not handling the bait. You're just we, providing we, a space yeah. to keep it. We used, yeah. we used to handle yeah. bait 20 years ago. Hmm. It was not a pleasant experience under the bait trucks. <laughs> <laughs> One of, the, one of the fishermen said, I'll get bait and take care of it, and did it for years. Uh, he's now kind of stopped because the financially, the, there was a lot of money in it. 
right now it's you know mm -hmm. on on the level that he's at or we're at unless you're unloading big trawlers there's not there's there's mm -hmm. no money in bait it's just a headache it's mm -hmm. it's it's okay it's a problem for the future of the industry and, and mm -hmm. it can't be expressed tonight it is these guys are paying an awful lot of money yeah do you have the square fish. footage of the, or the cubic feet of the coolers that are currently there so we can maintain that um n no we can get it yeah but okay. just for us but as we think about conditions mm -hmm. that might be yeah yeah should we, agreement that should we meet his points one at a time or yeah, yeah, yeah. Make no, a no, big no. list <laughs> no I, I think okay. he, Sure. Yeah. Um, so another concern was um, the number of available buyers in the area. Uh, at this time, um, we have the co-op um, and the Reedies. And I guess who is buying lobsters, too, from local fishermen? From mm -hmm. how many fishermen? Dennis and Gary. Dennis two. and Gary, so mm -hmm. two of them. Okay. Um, and so with them purchasing the co-op, there would actually only be one next year because uh, the Reedies have sold to a Canadian company now. Mm -hmm. So we won't be able to sell there, I guess, anymore. We'll be going to Saco to sell to them. If we want to sell to them, their station will be in Saco. From what I understand, just from speaking with some of the fishermen, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure exactly of how that will all work. But Can you explain that a little bit more? I mean, in other words, you, you're bringing your, your haul in. And right the now, the lobstermen I know go where they can get the best price right. most of the time, or mm -hmm. whatever's the best value. I mean, if right. you're driving forty minutes and right. it's only ten cents difference, right. and you're spending right. sixty dollars in, in fuel, fuel. You're probably right. just gonna sell to. The so right now, where are you guys out offloading or selling? I'm selling primarily to Tim. I've okay. sold to him for quite a while. Um, and sometimes there's a, a real necessity to be able to sell your catch really close right. by because when it's 98 degrees, that's right. You yes. got to unload it ten fast. degrees, right? And you don't have, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you just have a pickup truck right. with, without, you know, a cooler or anything, right? Then, but, you know. but over the last several years, having the Reedies have moved in, it's really given us a much, a, it's given us a good price. Like before, so, who are the re who, who so there are the lobster processors that bought the building next to the clam bake. Okay, that's and what so they I have a holding okay. building, and then they have a processing okay. building yep. where they're actually buying from from you guys. fishermen. Yeah, and um, there's people coming from all around to buy there, uh, but they were offering a higher price to sell to them, and it right. actually uh, for a while we were able to get a little bit higher price from everybody because obviously it's supply and demand. And right. If people have higher price, people will go there. So. But, but, price. Would, but would you say they're closing down that operation? Uh, so I guess they sold, from what I understand, to a Canadian company. So there's now a Canadian-owned uh, company, but they may not be buying lobsters at that building next year, which is in Pine Point. It'll be, we'll, they'll be buying them at the other. It's, it's in response facility. to all the tariff uh, yeah, right. business, right. Uh, frankly. Um, yeah. But they are building a new facility in the Saco Industrial Park, which is may be a buying opportunity. It's not the industrial park. No, right. no, it's, no, it's, it's just, actually right it's under one in the Blue Haven. It's just over the Scarborough line. It's in um, and, and I apologize, I don't want to confuse things, but I'm just trying to get straight in my head um, as to exactly going back to what the, then the importance is of the co-op to you guys. Um, you know, how much are you selling there? Uh, I get the bait thing. I absolutely get that. Uh, my, but just so you know, my, we have I, have lo I don't own, have lobster licenses. My husband does. Um, yeah. But um, so I was just trying to get in my head yeah. what the importance is of this Pine Point Co-op as far as you know you're not necessarily offloading the. I mean, anyway, that, yeah. that's that's yeah. that's right. Just a, the one list. piece of the dynamics, you right? Know, it was the whole dynamics of the market. Yeah, but place. majority of the fishermen in Pine Point at this time are selling to that co-op. Okay. So, so Tim, can you, do you will you buy from any local fisherman that brings product in? I mean, indiscriminately, you'll buy at most. Steam. Most likely, I mean, the, the, there is a little determining factor. Um, certainly, the guys that sell those all the time get priority. Mm -hmm. um, We've been pretty easy on people that sell elsewhere and come in only when they want to. Mm -hmm. Not to our benefit to do that, as we try to keep everybody in all the time. Mm -hmm. But we've been pretty easy on you need to sell. Come in, we're not going to turn you away. 
We've uh, right now. I looked this year. We bought from sixteen uh, individual boats, small and big. He's one of the top ones. He's good. Okay. Um, sixteen out of Pine Point. Eight boats bring us product out of Camp Ellis. Mm -hmm. uh, small and big. You know, and do you buy steamers too from the we, local? We buy uh, steamers mostly for in-house use, um, and it, and it's I say minimal. We bought uh, 200 bushel in 2018, which is not. For y'all level seems like a oh, lot. Like Our level is it, on the steam level is nothing. Uh, I mean, we, we twenty years ago. We were buying steamers and we were buying a couple hundred a week. Um, it just, very little margin, a lot of overtime. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at that point in time, Pine Point was digging a, was digging a large steamer. Right. We used to call them Jurassic Parks. <laughs> <laughs> real hard to sell, real hard to make money on. Uh, right. Steamers, the, the steamers now would be Dog over more, and and Scarborough has a, a very two-inch small steamer that's that's you know a high priority item. With a good yield. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Tim, how many boats um, do you know are selling from Pine Point? Do you know how many lobster boats there are down there that are actually selling know. product? I don't know. I mean, there's there's. Maybe 20, 30? 20, I don't think 30. I would say 25. 25. Tops. And you're, yeah, I mean, so I'm you're just, buying I'm from just looking in my head going, who doesn't sell <coughs> this? Yeah, so you're buying from like when 60, we're 70, buying, 70%. Yeah, we're of from the, 70%. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yes. we're, we're, maybe the, you're correct, the bait cooler has a lot to do with it. Oh, yeah. We try to pay Portland price. Uh, you know, and and you know, Portland price. Is close to the highest in the state. Yeah. Um, it just it's, it's a lot of competition. Um, and to be honest, the the, the wholesale lobster business is, is iffy. You've got to have uh, got to have something else to rely on besides wholesale lobsters. We have the restaurant that produces income. It just has to. A lot of the dealers, the big dealers in Portland, sell lobster bait. And it's a big money item. They don't care if they make money in lobsters. They just want to get the boats in, sell them bait. And if they turn over lobsters for 10 or 15 cents, that's okay because they're making a lot of money in bait. And that right. guy comes in and buys bait every day. That's the important part. Right. It's, it's, you know. Okay, Travis, I think time's flying. So. Sorry, I don't mean to... <clears throat> Delay. Well, Go just, ahead, yeah, going back to the concerns, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of the concerns stem from the fact that Tim and Gary, you know, we've been so lucky uh, to have them um, running the co-op down there. And uh, I think that the, the fishing community in Pine Point, by and large, has uh, really had a good working relationship with them over the years. And uh, um, by comparison, uh, the Lobster Pound, which is a very similar uh, facility uh, just down the street, uh, hasn't had the most popular sort of uh, rapport with the fishing community. As you know, I don't know what it was like 40 years ago. I think that they bought from a lot more fishermen back then and bought from clamors back then. But I think that as they become more successful, at least from what I've heard in my personal experience, uh, they just they they have become unpopular and they have gotten to the point where they don't um, they only buy from one or two fishermen or one or two uh, lobstermen and they haven't bought clams in over 20 years to my understanding and despite being right there overlooking Jones Creek and uh, and there's a, 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 a lot of other issues. I mean, their, their restaurants are certainly very popular um, and successful, uh, but that's brought in a lot of complaints about parking and traffic and noise and, uh, and you know, uh, 
looking at how that trek that I mean we can't predict the future of, of how uh, you know that ownership at the co-op would, would be but I mean I think looking at uh, the, the past and and using the lobster pound as an example it doesn't bode well because uh, we don't want to lose our ability to, to sell lobsters and clams there and sell them in such a way that like you know has been so easy going and we haven't had to be really loyal and we've been you know fish lobstermen are able to be you know uh, lobstermen are able to be um, uh, they're able to bring their own bait and just store it down there. I mean, it doesn't seem like the co-op gets much out of that that deal. And so, yeah, uh, there's concerns uh, of, about that. And I mean, Sue has has explained, uh, you know, that she wants to keep it the same, and that, that would be great. But I mean, you know, we we'd like it's like the thing you'd, you'd like to take someone's word for it, but you know, based on uh, the track record. It suggests otherwise. Do you pay for bait storage? No, we 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 get to store it there to, if we sell the lobsters to them. So it's like a you buy our lobsters, while you keep your bait. You sell us your lobsters, we get. But but your bait. knowing lobsters the way I do, <coughs> you it sounds like you're not always selling there because you obviously want to get the best price. Well, actually, that's why I'm for curious some how people. I would say that may be true. Personally, not myself. I yep. think Tim could even speak to that. There's some times where the guys just up the street just moved in and wanted to get all the lobster men. Tim had always been super good to us and loyal to us, so even though they were paying right. 15 cents more, we stayed with Tim yeah. because, but it, some of it right. had to do with that bay cooler, you know? Right. Nobody, I, I think it's pretty obvious when people are doing that and, and when that's the case. I mean, I was just curious because I know uh, where we keep our boat not to. Get off the track, and I, we don't have a commercial license. We've got anyway. Yeah. For tourists, but sort of like lucky catch type of thing. But uh, but my my question is because we pay, but we pay through our dockage fees, pay for the use of the bait coolers. So I was just curious oh, how that worked yeah. with you guys. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just, I'll just go through these as fast yeah. as I yeah. can, because yeah. there is some real concerns in here, and I just want to get them on yeah. the table. Sorry right. for the delay. Uh, so Mr. DeCroster is one of our members. He was asking, uh, has there been any discussions about continuing the true co-op? It seems like the announcement came very quickly, and the community is just learning about the sale and upcoming. Uh, there are, there is a small group of, or I wouldn't say small, there's a decent-sized uh, group of fishermen who are interested in a co-op, given the opportunity. Um, Moving on, there are some other concerns. Uh, the real concern uh, a lot of people had is the parking. For the, uh, most people expect that the restaurant's going to be expanded. Um, I think that's a lot of um, uh, Miss uh, Sue and Vinny's uh, business now. So I think it's pretty obvious that the that even as Tim said, you really need that other uh, source of income to supplement the lobsters. So they're expecting the business of the restaurant is going to be expanded, and. Um, what are they going to do about parking? Parking is already a major issue down there. Um, apparently, there's a 25 spaces uh, that is leased. I think Mr. Hall mentioned mm -hmm. that at the beginning of the meeting. So I just think that's one of the major concerns of everybody is how that's going to be because I think you guys have had some experience. I know we as the Coastal Waters and Harbor and Shellfish Committee have over the last couple of years with um, rearranging that parking lot and trying to figure out what works best, especially in, during the summer months. Mm -hmm. And I know the work is just now in this, or just some of it happened this year and some other the thought the following up mm -hmm. in the spring. Yep. So how will that all be changed? Um, uh, there was also uh, the question of what can we do to ensure that this stays, um, stays a, a, a lobster buying and clam buying facility to help, you know, to keep the fishing community working, because if it was to go away, there really would be no infrastructure left for sales of lobsters and clams and aquaculture now. Aquaculture is becoming huge. Uh, the Scarborough River is the prime place for it. So um, that's going to be up and coming. Uh, and and what, 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 kinds of, uh, what kinds of things could we put in place to ensure in the future that now it's, they, you know, we say that it's not going to change, but you know, in ten years they decide that the restaurant's doing so good, lobstering stinks, the bait coolers 
really smelly. Let's just get rid of it. There's no, there's no legal document in place that says that. Um, and there was also some discussion amongst a few. Uh, sorry, let me see. Ten days. Okay, so the legal thing. A lot of people are talking about live inter inf uh, live entertainment and music, like at the bait shed. Um, a lot of people would be. Are, are kind of upset that that may take place down there at the Pine Point because um, it's very quiet down there now, uh, especially at night. It's a place where people are going and doing their kayaking and paddleboarding, and um, some of the issues over the last several or the last year was just like some of the live music. Um, if it were to move down there, it would just be right there on the water and close to that, you know, serene <coughs> environment. Um, uh, you know, cheat, uh, okay, um, I guess there's some questions about, uh, we were, they were asking about the town selling this for a dollar, so one of the concerns is that the town's intent of selling this property to the Fisherman's Co-op originally for a dollar was to support the fishing and working waterfront. And now it's kind of come, now as, as we're learning, it's coming to like a more, it's, if this sale takes place, now it's a private entity and it's no longer a cooperative. It's no longer that fishing uh, co-op that it has been for 50 years now, 60 years now. So in order for, um, what, what, what kinds of things can we do to, to make sure that you know it, it is it is maintained. If if this sale does take place and if it is approved, um, can the fishermen be given uh, like a spot, like granted some areas where we can keep a bait, a truck full of bait, or a, you know a, a lobster truck to put our catch in, and all go to sell at the same time, just to kind of alleviate that uh, concern. Um, And I think that's most of the, there was also a couple of things, I, I mean, the nightlife kept coming up, um, having people that are, you know, drinking down at the co-op around all the boats and all the mm -hmm. equipment that's down there. There's possible liability issues, also vandalism of people's gear and equipment. Um, um, all that kind of stuff. Basically, it kept kind of coming back to increase parking, more people, crime, and uh, yeah. What was that? I think that is the general good overview. Of yeah, the I mean, it just the, the the parking, you know, was a big thing, and, and that traffic down at the bait shed, and how that uh, has affected the uh, sort of that community and uh, sort of the uh, the character of that neighborhood. Uh, a lot of people have complained, complained about that. Some people have uh, sold their properties down there and moved away uh, because of, of that. And, I mean, obviously the co-op is a different place, but, I mean, using uh, the lobster pound and the bait shed as sort of, uh, you know, the precedent that's been set, you know, yeah. we're, the concerns and issues have been brought up around that, and we're just kind of forward, forwarding them to this issue of the, co you know, yeah. the future of the co-op, basically. Just I you. just have one more thing. Sorry, I don't mean to, to take too long. There is the f the the issue that I've heard as well. Um, where people are concerned that um, should this sale take place, uh, Bailey's will be like a fairly large company, and um, should they ever sell all their properties to like one buyer, um, it, it would be attractive to out of staters as well as you know it would take a large company to come up with that much money to buy those properties. So we're just concerned, you know, we'd like to see, uh, in order to feel comfortable with this as a working waterfront community, um, we'd like to see some sort of covenant that would either give us, as a fisherman, the right of first refusal should there be a sale on the co-op again in the future, or some sort of covenant that ensures that that bait cooler remains a bait cooler and that that site remains a lobster buying station on site. Yeah. Good idea. Just to ensure that should moving forward in the future it change there's some protection against that so i guess with that any 
Any comments, discussion from town council members? Sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm a multi-leader. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Um, I, I, I'll be right up front and let you know that I have concern about disappearing work and waterfront you know, everywhere in the state. Um, and I absolutely agree, you know, that, you know, when you get more and more development pressures, I mean, we've seen this in Portland, where they just put the moratorium there on the yeah. hotel or whatever. Thank you very much. Yeah. I was happy to see that. Um, but by the same token, we want to make sure we work some sort of an agreement because you've got some people who are already willing and able buyers. In case you don't know, I'm also a real estate broker, so I bring a few hats to this. Um, who want to do the right thing, and I think it's good to hear, you know, all of your concerns. I agree with you. Uh, I like what I've heard so far about the ideas. Just one of the comments you made about it being a co-op, and I know, it, and, and I'm not an attorney, so I'm going to start with that right now, but it sounds like you're still a cooperative legally, but you own all the shares. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and the co-op, what I would call, is a holding company. Yes, yeah. We set up a company called GT Management. Right. Mm -hmm. Gary Tim, I'm not sure why. He got first first That's dibs okay. on that. <laughs> anyway, um, we do it as a DBA. Sure. And and all the invoices, right. all the checks, everything is, is so it has, management DBA. So we're involved with this. It hasn't been a cooperative since, since 1997. 1997. Practically yeah, speaking. Practically. Yes. That's right. um, but anyway, that's just my both, thoughts. Both both GT and I won't go up by legal entities. I've got. Right, but you can sell your rights because you Shares. own them all to whomever a buyer yeah. would be. Okay. Yeah. Technically, they're shares to the co-op that are consolidated with two individuals. Right. Yeah. Now, but those two owners can sell the whole shebang to a whole other entity. There's nothing that would bar that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I think we could sell to to just sell the shares. We could sell it to a hundred. Yeah, yeah you could at, absolutely. So I wanted to build on some of the comments that uh, Jean Marie made uh, about this, you know, major status change, you know, from um, you know whether it is or is not technically a co-op or has been operated as one. According to what we're hearing from the producers, uh, you know, the voice of the folks that are, you know, buying and selling there, uh, it's operated as if it were still a co-op. It's been, you know, it's, that's been the character and that's been uh, something that's kept them there. And that, that's something that there are questions about how that will be affected by, by the sale. And, uh, you know, this is you know, really not a knock on Susan or Vincent. Uh, we know them well. They're good neighbors. They've done a lot in the community. You know, but there, you know, there is a group of people who are very concerned about how that's going to be affected in the future. And no, no matter what the intentions are, if there's not specific language to the effect or covenants of the sort that are in place now, um, it's very possible that could change or will change. So I, I'm, you know, very focused on those things. Um, you know, the assurances are are uh, are somewhat comforting, but they are by no means an obligation or a guarantee that the character would be maintained. And you know, Tom passed out this relic here from. 1963. So, you know, it's the intention of the Pine Point Co-op to keep the town landing at Pine Point open and free to all people forever. Therefore, I, speaking for the Co-op, take a very definite exception to remarks of the intention of the town to model it after um, some bad example that they had uh, apparently with the town landing. We at Pine Point want to be known as one of the few places on the coast of Maine where a person can enjoy the beach or launch a boat free of charge. You know, I'd substitute language there, or be able to store bait, buy and sell bait, buy and sell lobsters and steamers. Um, that's not really clear that that <coughs> has happened, or has happened uh, in large part uh, under the Bailey's uh, recent uh, and current operations. So I think that's, you know, that's something we really uh, have to pay attention to. Uh, even only one or two people that they're selling to now, that, that is a fact. That, that is something that we need to take into account. So that, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm hearing and my sentiment on this at, at this point. And Council Donovan, I know you have a commitment or, or something, so 
Uh, the, I'll quickly go over the things that uh, came to mind. Uh, the consequence of a highly leveraged purchase, uh, the increase to $900,000, uh, if, if this is a highly leveraged purchase, mm. I always worry about what the uh, impact of a foreclosure risk would have mm -hmm. on our covenants. So I'd want to have counsel advise us that they would not be undermined. And you have to also perceive that a bank can end up owning this. Right. Everybody can have a bad day and end up foreclo being foreclosed upon. So uh, that that's a concern of mine. Uh, uh, obviously, I think that uh, they're looking for the relief from certain conditions so that the quid pro quo can be that we can impose certain conditions. It's a negotiated arrangement, not unlike a contract zone in that mm -hmm. respect. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd want to confirm that the resource protection setback line is 75 feet, and I'd like to know what the 30 percent, what the applicability of the 30 percent expansion rule would be in this mm -hmm. property. I'm virtually certain that uh, uh, since it covers rivers and wetlands, that there's no question it mm. does apply. Oh, yeah. So building out towards the water is, is not restricted. Going up is what you always see the 30% rule apply <coughs> on shorefront properties. And you get these little squiggly little things at Higgins oh, yeah. Beach that, that represent the 30% expansion. So uh, parking is a major issue. Uh, and that I think we ought to be looking at. Uh, certainly the preservation of lobster buying in the bait shed. Uh, I'm sympathetic to the original concept seems to be mm -hmm. uh, a co-op concept, but it's it's changed. But some of the important characteristics would be good if we could retain. So that's that's my thoughts. Thank you, Councilor Johnson. Susan, could you respond to the anxiety that the lobster pound currently, let's say, buys from two lobstermen <coughs> versus yes. the co-op? <laughs> Yeah, I definitely can. Um, so as I said, it's a 105-year-old business. A lot has changed. Um, my father ran it um, prior to my husband and I being there. Mm -hmm. And the timing that my father was buying the majority of the lobsters, we actually had all tide access at our dock. The marsh has moved, and we no longer have all tide access at our dock, making it virtually useless for attracting fishermen. And so fishermen went down to this beautiful new pier that the town built <laughs> at the end of the street. And so they can drive their trucks on and off the pier. It's far more convenient to them at the co-op. And so they use it. And I understand that. But for a lot of reasons, we lose fishermen to, you know, just to ease of use and things like this. We had a bait cooler. Yes, we did. We, we decreased in fishermen over the years, a lot of which was due to my, some of my father's business decisions and not mine. But... Um, in the end, we had a few fishermen left who have been loyal to us for several generations, um, and it, we, we couldn't maintain the bait cooler just for two people, and so that was one of our reasons to change that over. Um, as far as at, at the meeting I went to with Will and um, Travis, they were questioning why we didn't just pull more fishermen away from the co-op, and what I'd like to point out is that you know there are rules in small business, and you know unwritten rule is you don't hire somebody else's employees by offering them another dollar an hour. And you don't take somebody else's fishermen if you expect to deal with them after that. <laughs> um, it's just, it, you don't just do things like that. We have fishermen who fish for us, and unless something major is going wrong, generally they don't skip around very much. So we sort of ended up in this position with a lot of different business decisions that happened, whether generationally even, and also because of what happened in the river and the town investing money in the co-op property that we couldn't afford to invest. Um, so we ended up where we were. I do not think as Will states, that it's a matter of us being incredibly unpopular with fishermen. I think you'll find that a lot of people are not here because there are fishermen who don't want to take sides on this one. We have friends who are fishermen that fish for Tim and Gary that fully intend to come with us. Um, it's just that it's a, it's a tough, small village, and a lot of people don't like to stand up and speak. And um, with all respect to Will and Travis, you know, they, they are probably our major opponents in this and it may not be representing the group at large. I tried to make sure that you were all um, given some emails from some people who do deal with us, mm -hmm. from people in the, the, the harbor master that was previously there, the, some of the <coughs> lobster fishermen, um, you know, people in the community who've known us for a long time and understand how we do business. And I, I do take exception to be being called unpopular in our area because I, I simply think that we have a vocal minority discussing our business practices, and I, I don't think it's well represented. Um, 
in response to, do, can I respond to a couple Keep of responding, others? yeah. Are you sure? Totally. Okay. Yep. Um, in response to, I'll, I'll pick off an easy one, which is the bait cooler. We fully intend to keep the bait cooler. Um, and because it attracts lobstermen, <laughs> you know, it, it is what it is. It's, it's a good thing. It's a way to attract people to sell to you. Um, Our restaurants needed as many lobsters as the co-op bought last year. Yeah, we, 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 bought, we bought over 200,000 pounds of lobsters from Portland because we didn't have enough from our local fisherman because he had all the local fish. Um, as far as adding restrictions on the bait cooler, I really think you'd be making a mistake on that and a, a restriction to have to keep it. And because as, as a real estate agent, you'd understand we've made a purchase and sale agreement at a certain amount of money with Tim and Gary for what is essentially their retirement money. Um, we have every intention of keeping it this way because, I will add, there is working waterfront restriction on this building already. Mm -hmm. Tim and Gary have already taken money for the working waterfront, so it is already restricted to working waterfront property. Um, it's a requirement that we keep it that way. But if you put additional restrictions on things like the bait cooler, when the appraiser from the bank shows up to look at these things, it is highly likely that the property, that the property value is going to decrease significantly. Um, as far as I'm concerned, as I said at the meeting to Paul Erickson, um, he was questioning whether it would, no, it wasn't him, I'm sorry, somebody at the meeting was questioning whether it would be okay to put restrictions like this in the building. I'm saying, it's fine with me, because we still intend to use the building as it is. The problem is, it's probably not okay with Tim and Gary, because you're, you're taking money out of their pocket when you do it. If we're going to use the building the same way, great, but I'm going to have to turn to them and say, I'm sorry, the bank won't loan money on that anymore because it's not going to appraise at, at the original amount if it has added restrictions to it. Um, so I just wanted you to take that into account, because it's not as, it's not as simple as, let's just make sure they do this for, in perpetuity. It does, affect, it does affect Tim and Gary and the property value, and we don't own the property yet, so it's not, it's not yet my issue, but if, if it were, that would be an effect. Um, as far as that, the idea, and I think you understood Sometimes there are people using your bait cooler who aren't even selling lobsters to you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that that's fair to a business owner. Um, certainly, whenever we have had people, I'm not, and, and Tim has been, is a much nicer man than, <laughs> than I probably am a too woman, nice. but uh, too nice. But um, I would fully support people using the bait cooler and selling lobsters to us. That's the way the job works. That's the way business works. Um, if people wanted to rent space in the cooler, and didn't want to sell to us, but want to want to pay to have some space. But you know, you have to pay to refrigerate it. You have to you mm -hmm. have to pay property taxes. You know, there's all kinds of things you have to pay. So um, people should be responsible for their own businesses. They're all small business people, and but we just to be we just want to be treated fairly and treat other people fairly. And I think that's what we do with the people that we deal with. Okay. Um, I just think before yeah, we, before I, I just get two more counselors just kind of share time. share where they are so and then I will come back and have this conversation I think this was an intent just to kind of get a pulse of where everybody was mm -hmm. um, and Tom's a master mm -hmm. and then then taking the chaos that's created to try to create a process <laughs> to, to no so Sean do you have any comments questions or Katie? Uh, ladies first. oh ladies first okay. <coughs> um, one question I had and oh. forgive my naivete but like was it ever explored it. to Potentially, I mean, it sounds like you ascertained this property over years by buying shares back. <clears throat> Did you ever think about selling shares back mm -hmm. to the fishermen? Is that was that option ever explored? Uh, no. Okay, it I'm was, just curious. Was, and then was, this this transaction really or this by, agreement, by this purchase and sale came yeah. by way of private agreement. It was not an open market kind of Correct. situation. Okay, that's all. I'm just curious. I'm also in real estate, so I. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I, ad additionally, we discussed the possibility of buying those shares. And then not coming to the town council. And I'll tell you, because it wouldn't have been a requirement any longer if it was still the Pine Point Fisherman's Co op, as far as my attorneys tell me. Um, but so we didn't want to. bought all of, all of his shares, shares outright. Well, that's just, I mean, that's how Tim bought the building. Mm -hmm. So, but we didn't want to do that because we really are not underhanded and, and we're not trying to sneak something by on somebody. We want to make it's a very visible property and we're very visible people. Um, we want to make sure that. Everything is as everyone understands that we're being mm -hmm. honest about what we want to do and how we want to proceed. <coughs> so I just I'd like you to consider the fact that we could have <coughs> tried to tried to do this purchase in another way, and we preferred to be very above board and, and speak with everyone. About the other it. thing is, is that property is deed restricted all the way around it. 
Mm -hmm. yeah, there are a lot of easements. Mm -hmm. Right up to the building is all an easement. Mm -hmm. To the um, fishermen mm -hmm. and the diggers. So there's a lot of access to I'm the curious building. to know more about, you, you mentioned the building itself is already restricted by yeah. covenant. Yes, the Working Waterfront that Covenant. Was, that's yeah. news to me. I'd like to know more about what those restrictions are. And I presume that was in exchange for some financial support no. you received? No. Yeah, they, they, we get a, a state loan. No, Working Waterfront tax rebate. Property uh, tax rebate. Uh, okay. yeah. but they, through the town. So it's already a restriction so it's on the important to understand what that is, whether that transfers to yep. subsequent owners, does, and yes. whether that vehicle provides some level right. of protection to some of the concerns expressed. Are, are you guys referring to the um, the DMR and the uh, Land for Maine's Future Covenant? No. no. So no, there's another the covenant. covenant. Yes. No, there is it is, and I don't think it's, I don't know that I'd call it a covenant. There is a, it's a deed um, restriction. There is, it, a working, and, there is a working waterfront property tax <laughs> program. So, where yeah. you, know, you could uh, the working reduce waterfront property come. tax if you're if you're working waterfront, um, can it be can it be undone? I believe it can be undone. Very expensive. Yeah, I think it's, as it's, it's, I think some things have come up tonight, and as Tom had said, he's still mm. doing some yeah. due diligence and some work. Mm. So I think it, it, the layers of the onion back. Here. We're getting <laughs> some of those layers, so this will be a continuing conversation. And Sean, I know, you know, oh. best for last year. Um, thoughts and just a couple of things I think that one we need to take into consideration it's interesting in this town that we constantly refer backwards to things of past and now um, let's be clear in 1963 when the comments were written in the paper half of us at this table weren't born yet um, and this community was very very different um, significantly smaller the markets were very very different so we have a very different market and a very different landscape so we have to really look not to what is the past about this community it's about what we want for the future and how we um, build a community that is already very important to us down at Pine Point. Um, I think that the issue of um, covenants and deed restrictions, I was a part of the team that secured the monies from the state for the working waterfront. That was about two and a half million dollars after the town's investment. Um, I think that was the total along with Bruce Gulliver and um, Dave Corbo. Mm -hmm. So I would like to understand what the covenants of that working waterfront piece are to make sure that we maintain that level of um, character that's related to that. Uh, parking, obviously, is a very, very big concern mm. um, with the success of every one of your restaurants, um, which I frequent all the time. Um, you know, I want to make sure that the neighbors aren't impacted negatively um, and that it truly is a, uh, continues to maintain the character. But the fact that I look at this is that um, you have a fishing business and a restaurant already there. You have someone who wants to buy it that's going to keep a fishing business with a restaurant. It's an equal transaction in my mind. I just want to make sure that the characteristic of what we have is maintained um, and that that working waterfront piece, access to the water by the fishermen and the um, shellfish, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the clamors uh, remains intact uh, and that the quality of that pier remains uh, what we intended when we funded that originally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will confirm with the town attorney, but uh, I'm quite certain of this, that the working waterfront covenant that the town accepted in exchange for financial support mm. for construction of the pier does not apply to these buildings. It applies to the pier and all the lands around it. And there are very severe restrictions as to what we can do on that property covered by the covenant, yeah. but it does not apply to these, to this property the building. with a building. Except for the pilot portion of the property that the new dock is built on. Yes. Yeah. There was the pier a portion, itself there's a and the parking of, lots around there's a, it. A, a new portion of the co-op. Yeah. property that the, no. the new dock is built on, and the covenant must include that. Perhaps and, right. and I just want to the, the one comment. But it's I, a very small portion. Yeah. Yeah. Can we, can you, no, yeah. just, and and so the only not, comment that I've heard from, from citizens is that, I mean, they're fishermen, is that they want to make sure that that small parking lot that's to the left remains dedicated to commercial fishermen right. so that they maintain access, and that is truly dedicated to them. That's entirely covered in the covenant. Right, so. mm -hmm. and they want to make sure that stays. So, so I think I know we're pushing up against our timeline. So I will, I've kind of, my personal views, I've kind of echo what everybody has said. For me, I think the most important thing for me is protecting the original intent of the working waterfront. And certainly one of those pieces is the 25 parking spaces you need for your business. Um, but that is also needed. So I, I, you know, I think listening to the conversation, I think, Tom, the next steps are you need to do some, some more digging. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we will circle back probably with a process about what the next 
next steps are. And yeah, I'd like to hear what's the expectation that you have a purchase and sale agreement in place. I assume it's time sensitive or has a, a time Definitely, associated. Definitely, yeah. We were expecting, as you told us, to be able to go to the town council meeting on February 6th. For, to petition well, I laid for out a changes. potential process, but yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it starts here. Yeah. Yeah. And um, our closing date was February 26th. <laughs> okay, okay. and, and for, for folks that are sitting in the audience, um, what we'll do is we're going to convene to the regular town council meeting, but folks that didn't get a chance to make any public comments on this, at the, at the top of the meeting will be a chance to make public comments if you wish. So if folks want to stay for another five or ten minutes, they're welcome to come to the podium. So I guess with that, um, thank you, everybody. Thanks, yeah, thanks for joining thanks. us. Thanks. Um, thanks for sharing. Thanks for thanks you guys for having us. Yeah, I appreciate it. <coughs> so are you, you're not.
Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, this is the meeting of the Scarborough Town Council, Wednesday, January 16th already. The year is already going fast. Um, and what I'd like to do is call to order. Our first item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance, but I understand we have some representation from the Boy Scout, local Boy Scout group, Troop 47. They're here for a badge on citizenship and community, so I think they've been volunteered, maybe not very <laughs> happily, <laughs> to come join us up front and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is just the roll call. Please. Councilor Baybine? Present. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Caterina? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Chairman Hayes? Here. Um, with that, we're going to open it up to general public comments. And again, that we did have a workshop for those that are just joining us on a prior item, but I think there's some in the audience that may have wanted to give public comment. This is, a, this is for public comment for anything that's not a direct agenda item, so at this point, Anybody that would like to come up and speak at the podium, please do so. And I do apologize. I was told that um, the audio is very hard for folks to hear. So uh, I suspect on replay, uh, it's, it's fairly good. So if anyone's really interested in the conversation, uh, if you watch the replay, you should be able to hear it quite well. But I apologize for that. So would you like to join us? And I think what we need is just usually your name and address. All right. Uh, my name is Liam Erickson. I live at 288 Pine Point Road, and uh, I've been digging clams for the past eight years, and it's something that I take pretty serious pride in. While I don't really want to be a clam digger for my whole life, I like to think that it's uh, something that will remain a part of my life um, as long as I stay in Scarborough, which I hope to stay in Scarborough forever. Uh, the dock is my favorite place ever, the co-op in Pine Point, and um, it is concerning for me to think that uh, the, the possibility of it being purchased by the Bailey, the Bailey Pine Point group. Um, in the years that I've spent down at the co-op, either recreating or working, um, it's become pretty clear to me that uh, the Baileys, um, again, from my experience, uh, they don't really buy clams from any clamor that I know. Like I said, I've been digging clams for eight years, and I know most, if not all, the clamors down there. And I don't know one clamor that sells clams at Bailey's. And there is 25, 30 of us, something like that. Um, so that's, that's too bad. And from what I have heard, there's only two lobstermen they buy clams for. I think that's a shame, especially considering um, all the lobstermen that are right around the corner. Um, and I guess I would just like to remind the members of the town council uh, that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And I would like to point out that I don't believe that the Baileys have um, conducted themselves as good neighbors in the past um, at their locations. For example, so were mentioned um, being noise, parking, the driving, the neglecting to buy local seafood and sell it at their local restaurants. So thank you for your time and the opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you. Would anybody else like to join us at the podium? Uh, my name is Robert Odlin. I currently live at 38 Jasper Street in Scarborough. But I think it's important to mention I was uh, living at 6th Avenue 6, uh, directly next door or diagonal from uh, Bailey's Lobster Pound. It's a little difficult to speak about this because the repercussions could make things uncomfortable if the sale of the co-op, which I know is not a co-op, 
only a name. If the sale of the co-op moves forward and goes to the, the clouds, uh, I'm going to be looking to sell to them, but here I am going to try to muddy the water. Uh, when I first moved to Pine Point 15 years ago, it was a lobster, uh, the, um, the bait shed wasn't there. The bait shed was actually a bait shed. Let me back up. Um, I'd hear the barrels. I wasn't lobster at the time. I was commercial fishing. I've been commercial fishing for 35 years. And I've seen a lot of changes in those 35 years, mostly to the detriment of the commercial fishermen through development. Uh, restaurants uh, make a lot of money, and fishermen uh, sometimes get pushed by the wayside. <clears throat> we all know what's going on in Portland. And I think the fear is that it could happen in a sl slightly lesser degree in Scarborough. So <clears throat> the, um, uh, when I moved in, it was uh, a lobster buying station with a bait cooler. And slowly but surely, that bait cooler uh, ceased to exist and turned into a, a very successful um, bar restaurant. So successful that uh, for about four months out of the year, it, it deteriorated our, uh, my family's uh, uh, enjoyment of the area. I'm trying to think of the phrase I'm looking for. Quality of life. We moved. We moved from having a water view and uh, our house, you know, beating down the mortgage to a bigger house away from the water, away from that noisy restaurant. We have two small children. We couldn't go out in the street to uh, play or anything like that because we had to watch out for too much traffic. And then we had to watch out for the valet parker guys that were in the, in the area. So we're much happier now uh, where we live. And I am lobstering full-time out of Pine Point. I fish year-round. So one of my concerns is will the um, restaurant, I'm oh, sorry, will the, the um, co-op continue to maintain a year-round buyer base? And I would like to see some sort of uh, legal covenant to allow, um, not to, to, to allow, to uh, make sure that the what happens to the new bait shed doesn't happen to the old bait shed. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else this evening? Hi, Susan Bailey Clough. Um, sorry, I didn't get to address some of the concerns <coughs> before, but I'll go through quickly and especially speak to Liam and Rob's issues. Um, we absolutely want to continue the working waterfront. I, I think I don't want to go down the road of specific gripes that people have with each other in a small town. We've been living in a very small town for a long time and some of these longtime families have potentially problems with us that don't relate to the subject at hand. Um, but to speak very specifically to quality of life and what we've done in Pine Point because I feel very strongly that we have contributed positively to the community. I, I take exception with the fact that we have not. Um, it, Rob's uh, current wife bought a property across the street from a, at the time, 85-year-old family business in a business zone when they were in a residential zone. Um, I also take exception to the idea that we weren't successful before the last 15 years. Um, our lobster pound has been putting thousands of lobster rolls out the door since 1915. I have pictures to prove it. And I can tell you that I've been working there since 1978. And there's traffic in Pine Point. There's always been traffic in Pine Point. This is not new. Did anything increase with the bait shed? It probably did. And when we had problems, when the neighbors told us they had problems, we hired valets at our own expense in order to try to dispel any problems. When there's a problem um, with people causing an issue, I'm the first one to call the police and, and hopefully you know, Tom can go back in police records and see that I, I am the one trying to maintain order. I am trying to make sure that everyone has a positive experience. Um, speaking to Rob's concern about the, the, the area and the village, um, he sold his house to someone who uses it currently as an Airbnb. So that doesn't bother me a bit, but it does bother some of the neighbors that are around the people that currently own his home. Um, there was mention of a monopoly during all this, and I never got to address that fact. I, I do not feel that, e even when you have two buyers, you know, there's no chance of monopoly, but there are a lot of buyers in the Old Orchard area. There are not necessarily people who are big business buyers, 
but there are a lot of people buying in the catch from local lobstermen that don't necessarily have a large wholesale lobster business. I wish that the readies were here to express themselves, and I think I'll reach out to them and have them speak to you, but um, they are not ceasing doing business. It is possible that they won't be buying out of that particular building, but they're actually building a very expensive facility right over the Scarborough line um, on Route 1 in Saco. So they, they will continue to be a very <coughs> large player as they're investing a great deal of money. Uh, as to the entertainment issues, that is something that gets granted every year. So I, I don't see that it's an issue. First of all, I don't see that there's room in that building to do it. But second of all, um, it would have to be approved. And if everybody disagreed, they can tell us we can't have a license. Um, and my last one was parking. We have no expansion of the restaurant intended. We don't think we need any more parking intended. If there is a major issue with parking that's existed historically, we're willing to uh, address that with the town and try to figure out solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Mo Erickson. I live at 288 Pine Point Road. Um, you know, it's no secret that lobstermen and fishermen are very strange bunch. I married one and I've birthed one. <laughs> so I, I know that they're very fickle and they can be very, um, you know, they're like a bunch of old biddies that cackle here and there and, and God love them for that. But um, a lot of the, I, I did talk to a lot of fishermen um, because I'm also on the Coastal Water Committee and I wanted to get a, a rough idea, you know, what was the undercurrent, what were the thoughts of this purchase? And um, I tried to get quite a few of the lobstermen to come, but they didn't want to. And it's not because they're shy. Um, they, they're afraid of the repercussions if they spoke about uh, their feelings of having the co-op be bought by the people buying it and, and, and what, would, what would become of, of their business and where would they sell. So even though you might not see many, many of these guys out here, it's definitely a concern that it would, in fact, maybe not become a true monopoly, but pretty doggone close. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is, um, I think it's interesting that in all this time that the Baileys have only sold to Gary and Dennis, I mean, only bought lobsters from them, and that now, um, and really have not bought any clams from any clamors in, in Pine Point, and, but that they're saying now they want to. Well, I would say that too if I wanted to try to buy the building, and so I just I, I, I grapple with that intention. Um, the other thing is, um, as far as as far as the parking, I know when they built the garage, they rented a, l a little spot down by Snow's Canning Factory factory to have their workers park down there, and I see for a fact in the morning because I go running that their workers park along those extra spaces along East Grand Avenue, and that's where their, most of their workers park. And I know that it's no secret, you know how I felt all summer about the parking at the bait shed. And I, I don't think it's gonna be as bad as the co-op, but I can promise you that the line on right and left side of that parking, of that of East Grand Ave extension, um, or King Street, going right into the co-op, I'm sure there'll be plenty of cars right lined up along there. And I, I don't think that's a great idea with big boats coming and on trailers and things like that. Then another thing I wanted to um, ask about is, um, what if the town were to help try to find some grants and actually maybe turn the co-op back into a lobster, a true lobster co-op, um, and and see what is the interest in some of the fishermen and the and the shelf the clam diggers actually buying the co-op back i think that's important it it's it's part of the history in pine point and i think the town owes the village of pine point an obligation to help try to do that if they can if if it's possible i don't know um and and above all when somebody says they're going to be a good steward and they say they're going to buy lobsters and they say they're going to buy clams and they say they're not going to go up as high as they can to rebuild and, and improve on the building and, and turn it into a restaurant, a bigger restaurant, <clears throat> and they say they're not gonna want more parking, and then they promise that they will do all those things, and then they decide not to once they buy it. 
what's the town's recourse? You have none. You can't make them give the property back. And just because somebody promises they're going to do something doesn't mean they are. And um, I think that's really important. I, I think that they have every good intention. That's not what I'm debating. But my, my question is, is what is the recourse when, the bait, when they decide, you know what, there's no money in bait. I don't want the bait here. I don't want the bait shed here. And then what? Or when they'd say, you know what, we said we were going to buy, show us how many, why didn't you buy lobsters from all the lobstermen in Pine Point? Why did you have to buy 200,000 pounds of lobster from people in Portland? I think that's a real question that needs to be answered. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on this? My name's Nathan Orff. I live at three Black Point Meadows. Um, I've had a clam license, a student clam license in Scarborough for five years, and I now have my commercial lobster license. Full commercial, and I think I'm the youngest guy fishing on Pine Point by like 12, 13 years. <laughs> and uh, it's grown up in Scarborough, it's always been kind of important to see the co-ops, you know, the character it has and the way it supports the community with the significance of the shellfish industry and the lobster industry out of Pine Point, it would be sad to see that building turn into something that it hasn't been and something that it's not supposed to be. I mean, we get that huge grant to build the pier due to the fact that there is so much commercial fishing industry out of Scarborough. And I don't have the personal history with any of the families in Scarborough that a lot of the people have been talking about, you know, possible issues that might have persisted for generations. I'm kind of coming in fresh, and I don't want to make any enemies. I don't want to not trying to make any friends, but I think there'd be a lot more lobstermen, a lot more clam diggers up here talking and voicing their concerns, except for the fear of if this transaction goes through, not being able to sell to the new owners. And that's definitely a fear of mine too. I don't mean to make any enemies on any side of this, but at the same time, I see the potential for the restaurants and the growth there. And you know, restaurants, I'm a marine entrepreneurship major with a double major in aquaculture, and I see that restaurants are a much more stable way to do it than you know fishing, and it's always going to be a thing. You can always have a restaurant, but fishing is questionable. So, the type of management and selling this property with no covenants, I think, would be a big risk to the town. I mean, it's been brought up that if an inspector was to come in and survey the property under the tents that there was going to be covenants on it, that it might come back at a less appraised value. But if the town decides under their control that that property should be sold under the covenant that it's supposed to be a commercially maintained property for fishermen, then that would be the actual value of the property. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, any other comments or kind of going, going, gone? Thank you, we'll close, we'll close public comment at this point. Um, the next agenda, agenda item is item number five, which is really the minutes from December 19th, regular town council meeting, and the January 9th special town council meeting. Um, I'll pause for a second and let, let the crowd kind of thin. Thank you, everyone. So I'll have a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> any, any comments, discussion? Changes? All those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. Um, there are no adjustments to the agenda. Um, items to be signed, I think I see some paper in front of us. I assume that's yes. my duty at the end. Um, the first item on the agenda is order number 19001, public hearing and action action on the following new requests from Giovanni. Can you help me with the pronunciation? Del Delacana. Um, Delacana. 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 <laughs> um, little Caesar's Pizza located at 200 Gallery Boulevard. And usually you give us, the town clerk gives us an update on any issues we need to know about the request. Yeah, this is uh, an existing business that has been sold, has been purchased by this gentleman, and the licenses are non transferable, so he has applied. Everything is, um, he's met the criteria of the application and with the code office. Thank you. Motion to approve. Public 
Okay. So moved. Second. Oh, probably. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I was just following Chief Wright. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, it was me. Um, I was following Would anybody like to speak on this issue this evening? No? Um, seeing none. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Um, all those in favor? Thank you. Old business order number 19002, act on the names posted to the various committee boards as recommended by the Appointments Negotiation Committee on January 9th, 2019. I think with that, do we need to read the names again or we just say it's in the document? Yeah, I don't think you need to. Uh, Tony, would you agree? You can read them. Yeah, I would agree. That's good. So, <laughs> it's in the packet. Um, so motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Jean, um, just being a member of appointments, um, I just want to thank all of the people in the town who are willing to step up and volunteer for our various boards and committees. And we do have some openings, um, so please check with the town clerk because we'd love to have your help. Thank you. And I had one, one comment. Councilor Hammond, yeah. Uh, I know everyone's going to read carefully through the list, but I did want to point out that the, uh, you know, these will become effective. However, the, the shellfish conservation one, and I believe the uh, coastal waters one re will require additional state approval, if I have that right. Uh, not for the appointments. It's not for the appointments? Not, oh. not for this piece. Okay. Of it. Strike my comment. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, discussion? All those in favor of approving the slate as presented? That's unanimous. Thank you. Um, next order of business is order number 19004, act on the request from the town engineer. Oh, no, excuse me. Um, order number 19003, first reading and refer to the planning board and proposed changes to chapter 405, the zoning ordinance of the town of Scarborough section. And I'm not very good with the Roman numerals, so <laughs> I will refer. Yes, 18. 18, 18B, 18B Higgs uh, Parkway yes. District, Long Range Planning Committee. So I think with that, Jay, you probably can educate us about what we have in front of us. Sure. Hello, thank you. Good evening. Um, so yeah, let's see. I, I put together a little memo on some of the work that the Long Range Planning Committee had done through the, uh, the fall and winter sort of grappling with this issue um, that came forward to them based on some of the work that the planning board experienced and some of the challenges they experienced in applying an existing language. Um, so um, just by way of quick background, the language that the, the Long Range Planning Committee is proposing and recommending uh, to councils really seeks to clarify existing process. It's not changing underlying policy, um, but we'll certainly chat about that as we go, I'm sure. Um, so just by way of quick background, back in 2012, uh, council adopted, <coughs> excuse me, some updates to the uh, Haggis Parkway District with an eye towards modernizing the zone and broadening the allowed uses within the district. Um, and to that end, as part of that, um, there were limited residential uses were uh, allowed in what was otherwise previously only a commercial district. Those uh, residential uses are multifamily uses, uh, dwellings within a mixed use building or live work uh, um, type units. Um, and they were permitted in the district only through a plan development review process, which is sort of getting into the nuance of our review process that the planning board does, a heightened review of a, uh, a development pattern. And certainly I can answer questions about that as we go forward if needed. Um, but the language that was inserted essentially was pretty simple. It said that uh, these type of residential uses are allowed, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, provided that the floor area of all residential uses within a plan development shall be a maximum of 40% of the total floor area of, the, of all the building area within the plan development. So essentially residential uses can be no more than 40% of, um, of the total uses, all the other uses need to be commercial. Um, so the issue came, um, <clears throat> well I'll, I'll sort of start, so the current pro the provisions um, the issue comes around when the uh, provisions are applied to 
a phase development or a development that you know is going to come in it, um, over time. They're not necessarily going to build out all at once, but maybe incrementally. <coughs> um, and when the planning board started reviewing a project in the first application of the of the current rules, someone was looking to do a phase development. Um, and it was determined through legal review, staff review, um, board sort of determination that you know, residential development could get ahead of commercial development. But the question became, how do you ensure that you meet that 40% threshold? Um, and the current language really doesn't give you any guidelines for how to do that. So as I said, over the course of a number of months, um, when we brought this issue to the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, we sort of de debated different approaches and, and ways to, to go about it. Uh, the, um, the proposed language modifications that are, are before you for first reading really are aimed at providing that regulatory approach um, that provides for the planning board to determine the maximum amount of uh, residential de development at the outset of a development that's coming through the plan development process. Um, so it really establishes how does the planning board identify plan board and applicant for that matter, identify what is the maximum uh, residential development right at the outset. Um, so that's what this language is intended to do. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions as you may have them. At this point, does anybody have any questions for town planner, for Jay? With that, motion to approve them. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Council Kettering, yeah? Uh, yeah, as a member of the Long Range Planning, who <laughs> added this around quite a bit, um, I think this is a great solution to any, um, a potential issue. And again, it's one of those things that um, we do our best when we do ordinances and uh, to make sure we cover the bases, but when you get actual applicability, uh, all of a sudden you're going, ooh, I guess there's a hole there. So that's what this attempts to plug. Thank you. Councilor Johnson. I read it and I understood it. So <laughs> <laughs> good <laughs> job. <laughs> Anybody else? That's all I got. <laughs> all those in favor? Again, unanimous. Thank you. Um, item order number 19004, act on the request from the town engineer to accept the $115,000 grant money from the Department of Environmental Protection for the Phillips Brook Watershed Implementation Plan. And Angela, yes, I, I saw her in the back. She moved, she moved on me. She moved up. Hi, um, Angela Blanchett, town engineer. Um, I'm here before you with a grant that we um, applied for and received for Phillips Brook. Uh, about the beginning of 2018, we completed a watershed management plan, essentially looking the two years prior to that, um, looking at the deficiencies of the stream itself um, and ways that we can use a roadmap to improve the health of that watershed and the stream and the, the fish and aquatics life within that stream. So the next step, once um, we were in front of the Council in 18 um, with the, the actual plan. The next step is to implement that plan. So we were in, we immediately followed that with applying to for a um, environmental protection agency grant, which is administered through DEP. So what I'm here in front of you is showing that we actually received that grant, and we do have funds um, in the fiscal year 19 um, capital improvement budget for um, our local match piece of that which was helped us um, secure that grant. Happy to talk for hours about it if you'd like. <laughs> Just have, 32 minutes. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> no way. Is that? Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Any comments by anybody? Mm -mm. I guess that. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Um, there are no non-action items. The next item, item nine, is standing and special committee reports. And I don't know if we want to start at Councilor Hamill. Hey. Start at the beginning of the alphabet with appointments. Um, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the appointments committee, uh, recommend the appointment of Robin Sanders. These are planning board appointments. Uh, Robin Sanders is a full voting 
Robin Saunders as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2021 and appoint Jennifer Ladd as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2021 and also appoint Rick Meinking as second alternate to fill a term to expire in 2019. And uh, there, once these uh, appointments become official, there will be no vacancies on this board. Um, and I just also wanted to add that uh, we have a running total now of uh, I mean, most of our full voting member vacancies have been filled except for I think about three, great. some 13 alternates that are uh, still available. So we're still trying to press to uh, get all of the committees fully staffed for full end alternates as soon as we can. So we'll be continuing with the next uh, uh, another round of, uh, of recommended appointments and uh, it won't be quite as long as the first one. <laughs> But thank you. Councilor Ketterman. Um, the only thing I have is tomorrow is ordinance at 4 o'clock. So we have a pretty full schedule. So stop on by at 4. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Foley. Um, yeah, I missed the last Conservation Commission meeting because I was on vacation. Um, and uh, but I did see the notes from that and looking to catch up with uh, a couple of the members just want to make sure the council is well aware they are moving forward with putting together a draft uh, ordinance which they will then send to the ordinance committee around um, plastic bags mm -hmm. so just something if you you know to keep in the back of your mind it's going to be coming to us at some point um, communications met this week but I won't steal Mr. Johnson's thunder I'll let him speak to that uh, and uh, while I'm no longer the liaison to the Eastern Trail Alliance I am still a member of uh, the uh, gala event uh, last year was their inaugural taste of the town it was held in um, over at Camp Ketcha and so right now we're slated to have that event again uh, in April and it was really a spectacular event, raised a lot of money for the Eastern Trail, which is, in my estimation, one of our great resources mm -hmm. here in town. Um, and even though we've got some funding in place to close the gap, per se, there's still uh, quite a bit of work uh, that needs to be done. Um, and it's a great time to just come, in and come out. So I'll have more deal details around that uh, as we go <coughs> forward. And ordinance is tomorrow, and that's it. Also Johnson. Uh, great. The communication. I hear you have thunder, so I'm, I'm with yeah, you. I know I have no thunder, actually. <laughs> uh, communications committee met on Monday, uh, two, excuse me, Tuesday. Uh, the big thing coming out of that is essentially we're going to resurrect our quarterly summits that were took place about a year ago, I believe. Uh, there'll be joint summits with the BOE uh, town council and members of the public. It'll be run primarily by elected officials, and we're looking just to do that once a quarter. And I think tentatively we actually have the dates, but I'm not going to spoil that yet because I don't think it's 100% uh, locked in stone. Uh, for liaisons, school board committee, uh, the last time they met, two things. They've undergone a uh, new superintendent search. They haven't quite, they're right now deciding which consultants to go with to help them through the search. And they have decided to shut down their Facebook page as a mm -hmm. body and to streamline more communication through the actual school department uh, social media. So oh, the, nice. it will be one-stop shopping, so you don't have to go to three to four different places, so to speak, to get some information on the Board of Education. Uh, I met for about an hour with the president of the Chamber of Commerce, Art Dillon. We had a great conversation. It looks like there's a lot of shared enthusiasm about the Career Pathways program that mm -hmm. is attempting to get off the ground or has been getting off the ground at the Scarborough High School. Um, between the Scarborough Education Foundation and Chamber of Commerce and the um, staff of the high school, it's clear that there's uh, overwhelming support for the program, so I'm hoping to get a little more cohesion behind the program to see if anything I can do in my, my role to, to help um, join all those forces, so to speak. And I'm meeting uh, for the Eastern Trail Alliance. I have nothing to report because we're meeting tomorrow morning for the first time, and I'll be briefed then. Sure. Uh, finance. Uh, we had our first meeting this week uh, to kickstart everything. We've decided that our meetings, our regular meetings, will be the fourth Wednesday of every month, with the first one being on January 23rd. It is our goal that at that meeting, um, and no later than the next regular meeting, or the first meeting in February, that we will be presenting a calendar for the budget uh, process of the budget season, along with its details, um, hopefully by that point in time. Uh, we did decide uh, with the concurrence of the uh, 
School Board's Finance Committee meeting, we will continue our joint um, sessions with them. We have two sessions uh, tentatively scheduled for February 11th is the first one. And I don't remember the March date, but uh, we'll announce that at a later time. But February 11th will be the first joint meeting to talk about the uh, joint effort reg regarding the budget. That's all. Thank you. Um, and with that, I have nothing to report at this point. Um, so Tom, I guess the town manager's report. A couple of quick uh, points of interest, perhaps. Uh, budget process has started in earnest for town staff. Uh, they're diligently working at the department level. I've provided some basic guidance. Uh, I, we are looking forward to the council providing further guidance at some point. Uh, but uh, the folks are well, un well underway, if you will. Um, Julie Kuchenberger, the superintendent, and myself have begun. We're actually halfway through our Listen to Learn effort. We had our second session today at noon, and we have two more scheduled uh, each of the next two weeks. So next Tuesday, the 22nd, uh, we'll be here uh, in these chambers uh, at 6 p.m. And then again on Wednesday, for the, uh, the 30th, for the final one, at 6 p.m. at the Wentworth School. We've tried to mix up the location, the time of day, to really expose ourselves to the community. Uh, frankly, so far this year, we've had uh, fairly sparse participation, but certainly lively discussion. So those that have come, I think, have uh, gone away with something, I hope. And uh, I think I can speak for Julie that we see it as a valuable use of our time, uh, even if it's a handful of folks. And uh, really, to our delight, uh, it's become more conversational. Uh, we're not lecturing. Uh, we're really there to listen. Mm -hmm. But in actual fact, uh, it tends to be uh, very much a give and take and people seem to enjoy it for that, for uh, the way it's unfolding. There does also appear to be interest, this came up at the Finance Committee conceptually and also in communications, at the elect officials doing the neighborhood budget outreach. Uh, those details are to be finalized, but there does seem to be interest on both uh, the part of this body and the Board of Education uh, to continue with that practice, which uh, seemed to be met with some success last year. We hope to repeat that. Um, it may not come as a surprise, but we did get notification from um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, that the, uh, the impending flood map changes uh, have been pulled once again, so they will not become effective. There's no, uh, it's a one-sentence one response. Uh, they've not provided any indication as to what the next step is, but um, our application was timely, so we're in. And I think, frankly, uh, if I'm reading between the lines correctly, they pulled them because they were met with a number of uh, <laughs> serious substantive applications for uh, uh, appeals, if you will, and they needed to buy more time to review them and respond. And now they're shut down. Uh, yeah. Perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. I don't, I don't believe that had anything to do with this notice, but uh, we'll keep you up to date, but the immediate pressure is off. <coughs> Uh, the town also was notified uh, last week that mm -hmm. we've been formally accepted as an uh, age-friendly community. This is the designation to awesome. the AARP. Many of you on this body have been aware of this and supportive of this for uh, many months, if not years, and I'm pleased to say that we're, we finally attained that status, and we'll know more about what that means. But this, uh, this whole project was driven by our community services department, um, really propelled through the um, community, uh, senior advisory committee with a really driving force. And so certainly more good things to come. And the last piece is kind of a human interest piece, I'll call it. I just want to share a couple of the initiatives that the police department's put forward, uh, really uh, directly under the leadership of Chief Moulton. Uh, he must be getting soft, soft in his old age, or it's the <laughs> kinder and gentler. Uh, but uh, the Operation Hope uh, initiative is really been a resounding success and it's really changed the mindset. Uh, it's really redefined for them what it means to serve. Uh, and I'm really pleased about that. I, I encourage them to take a, a bit of a risk, if you will. It's not traditional. It wasn't a comfortable or normal thing for them to take up. Uh, but they, uh, they are near to celebrate their 360th placement mm -hmm. in, in uh, treatment. Wow. And that's just such a tremendous uh, feat. Um, the chief also took the time to realize that this town celebrated its 360th anniversary this year uh, without any fanfare, frankly. And so he's actually challenged his staff uh, to do a 360 degree view, and this is a term that's used in HR for evaluations, mm -hmm. but uh, what that means for him, and he's challenged his staff, uh, is to really 
look all the way around us and assess what our communities and our mm -hmm. residents' needs are, from seniors to toddlers, from beaches to farmland, from dense neighborhoods to sparsely populated areas, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, I, I really credit him for you know, taking a pause, and I think a lot of it has to do with this change of mindset. <coughs> a couple of other initiatives that he's done in cooperation with the high school um, is something they're calling Operation KIND, and KIND is an acronym that stands for Kids in Need of De-Escalation. Mm -hmm. Many times our officers are dealing with domestic situations or highly traumatic situations in people's households, and the schools need to know that something happened last night, uh, and to keep an eye out for this kid. And so uh, it's, it's something that seems very fundamental, but um, it doesn't happen as much as it should. And so we're recommitting to making sure that there's good communication. Wow. Another one is a simple one, High Five Fridays. He's going to have an <laughs> officer show up at the schools and simply greet the kids on a consistent basis as they come in as a way to get them comfortable with officers. Um, so I just share those because I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that they're trying to constantly reinvent themselves and find a way to be relevant and of service to the community. And, uh, and uh, that's tough to do, to take the time to do that when you're in the midst of responding to 911 emergencies. So really proud of, of their efforts. I think they'll be talking more about these on their own, but I, I want to just uh, take a moment to recognize uh, what I see as really good work. Thank you. Thank you. In that relation to AARP being relatable to a lot of us on the council, it had nothing to do with our ages, right? <laughs> yeah, plus, plus, <laughs> I, I am a proud member myself. Uh, so, okay. No. Um, last item on the agenda are just councilors' comments, and I think this time I'll start at Councilor Bateman at the end of the table. Sure. Um, actually, um, I think I had said before I was going to try to provide regular updates regarding legislative information. I forgot to, so I'm going to do that here. <laughs> um, wanted to mention that committee assignments have come out um, for the Scarborough delegation, and we have a wide range of uh, focus um, that benefits the town overall. Um, I wanted to mention Representative McLean, who uh, represents a portion of Scarborough that's pretty much the 114 corridor at Jean Marie's house, <laughs> at Council right, Katarina's right. house, to the Gorham line. Um, and Gorham and other places. Um, he will uh, continue as the chairman of, the, of uh, transportation, mm -hmm. uh, which is critical given the, um, the highway issue or the new highway issue that comes from the turnpike that's going to go through that area at some point in time. Um, Representative Chiazzo was named to the Energy Committee, um, which he's getting to work already with many issues, um, including solar, uh, solar energy. Um, I have been fortunate enough to have been um, actually uh, appointed to the longest named committee. Um, and then the acronym is IDEAB. They had to add that B. They couldn't just call it IDEA. But it's the um, Innovation, Development, um, yeah, Innovation, Development, and Economic Advancement and Business Committee. So it's the old Economic Development Committee that's been re reorged. Um, so it's, that's uh, very, very exciting. Um, and I'm, I can't wait to get started with that next week. I did want to mention that Senator Sanborn um, has been appointed to the Appropriations Committee, which mm -hmm. is always wonderful. In fact, um, if you look at the history of Scarborough, Scarborough has um, generally always had some member um, of its delegation as part of appropriations going back many, many years, mm -hmm. almost 30 years, I believe. There is another committee. I just don't remember what the other committee, because senators get appointed to two um, because of their fewer. And then Senator Millette, who takes care of basically Spur, Wink, Prout's Neck, and, and to Southport and Cape Elizabeth, is also on the IDEA B committee with myself, and then I believe she's continuing on education. She's chair. She's chair of it. She's the Senate chair of education, so I'm a great resource with her. And then lastly, I wanted to mention um, three great pieces of news for Scarborough citizens. Um, Jean Lambro, um, a Scarborough resident, um, is the nominee for the Department of Health and Human Services mm. um, with an incredible background at the national level. Um, Peter, you must be aware of who, her, uh, who she yeah, is and her yeah. credentials, so it's pretty wonderful. Very impressive, yeah. um, Also, uh, if I get this wrong, I apologize, but Pender Macon, uh, Macon, Macon. Um, Macon is Macon. the nominee for the Department of Education Commissioner. Mm -hmm. um, she's currently an uh, assistant superintendent um, in Brunswick, mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, great news. And then I did want to, of course, mention that Dr. Uh, Dr. Margaret, uh, Marguerite uh, Penauer will be the doctor of the day tomorrow that I get to host at the uh, main house. <laughs> And so uh, I'm going to welcome her tomorrow, so it's really exciting. And she's an internist with uh, um, Intermed and Maine Medical and uh, lives here in Scarborough as well. So uh, exciting things going on. And that's all I have. Thank you. Councilor Johnson. Hi. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I lost a colleague and a very long-time Scarborough resident. Her name was uh, 
Pat Driscoll. She was 88 years old. Um, she was the lunch lady at my work, and right before she passed away, she said she started yelling at me because cable uh, the the town council meeting. She couldn't find them anymore, so I promised her that I would run up the flagpole. So this is me um, for Pat Driscoll, wherever she is, uh, voicing the complaint about the the change into 1302 for the town council meetings. So I have fulfilled my promise. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the only thing I have, a few, maybe three, four months ago, a uh, young man from the Veterans Home reached out to me, um, Josh Little, and uh, he is very interested in um, finding a way to better celebrate, commemorate our veterans in town. Um, we have a few different ideas, but I think initially um, I just would like to gather some people who have energy around uh, that cause. Um, and so if you're out there and you're watching, I know there's thousands of you, um, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to set up some kind of an informal meeting uh, to kind of talk through some of the ideas. We're talking about maybe creating flags for the Memorial Day Parade or some kind of a wall in Memorial Park, or I don't know what it could go into, but um, it could be a pretty cool project, and that's something I feel pretty strong about. So um, just looking to gain interest could be something the Boy Scouts are interested in. I don't know. Um, but just wanted to throw that out there. So I'm looking forward to kind of throwing that, throwing some energy behind that. And that's all I have. Thank it's you. cold it's outside. Cold. <laughs> and snowy soon. <laughs> Uh, yeah, speaking of cold, I read today that the polar vortex has split and is now heading our way. Great. And that's my lead-in for don't forget about our clink bags mm -hmm. and uh, donating to the heating assistance program. Uh, with the town and Project Grace, there are a number of people in town who have <coughs> struggled uh, to meet their heating bill needs, and we do an awesome job of that, so any donations would be appreciated through Project Grace. You can go online to Project Grace and give there. Or we have clink bags, and i got to start bringing them to council meetings again and handing them out. But that's a real easy way to just fill with your empties through the year and bring them to uh, the clink. Um, and along the legislative lines, um, because Representative slash Councilor Babine uh, didn't mention, but... Um, oh, yeah. I, as, as the uh, person on the Legislative Policy Committee for Maine Municipal, we're pretty excited uh, and very optimistic about restoration of Maine revenue sharing, which would be huge uh, for the towns, um, as well as the release of the senior housing bonds. Um, so we, we're optimistic that we're going to see a few things that will be helpful to the citizens of, of Scarborough. That's it. Thank you. A uh, couple of things I wanted to mention. One was I, I thought that after a couple of weeks of, uh, of workshops on big issues, I was very impressed again at the tone uh, and the transparency and the uh, you know the quality of the comments and the level of participation uh, you know in the workshop this evening. Uh, one thing I should add, I omitted the fact I, uh, William Hamill, the spokesperson for the Shellfish Committee, is. Indeed, my son, William. <laughs> and, we never uh, have guessed. <laughs> uh, I can assure you that we have very independent views on virtually everything. So uh, I don't think that our, that our blood relation will uh, have an impact on my ability to be objective. Uh, one thing I would also add, though, is that I am also related to quite a few other glamours in town. Yeah, yes. uh, Erickson's and Tui's, and so, so, uh, but I'm probably not going to take the time to call them out every time. So, uh, <laughs> thank you, and apologies for the delay. <laughs> thank you. Just a quick thing for me, much like Councillor Katarina, I know um, Project Grace is low on funds, and, and they're doing some fundraising now, so the seniors have a safe place mm -hmm. that they can go graduation night. So. They are selling sort of coupon cards that are out there. I know they do it for the sports teams a lot, but I know the fun is pretty depleted. So if, if anybody feels generous. Project graduation. Project graduation. Project graduation. Project graduation. Yeah. 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 What did I say? Project, 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 graduation. Graduation. Project graduation. I apologize. <laughs> so with that, I guess that concludes this evening. Stay safe this weekend. The weather is, they were saying 10 to 20 inches of snow on mm. Sunday. So Ooh. be safe. Um, we'll to adjourn. That, anybody second it? Second. second. All those in favor?
So who wins tonight, guys? Yeah, who I do again. Wins. No, it's Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It's Tony. Yeah, I heard this.